Very good evening everyone. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Here are the list of news articles chosen for discussion today and the video is time stamped for your convenience. Let's go on to the first news article. See this news article mentions that Telangana state government has not implemented the Ayushman Bharat scheme of the central government. So poor and middle class patients are denied the opportunity of getting free treatment for covid. So in this context let us know more about the Ayushman Bharat scheme and why is it important to implement it. See Ayushman Bharat literally means healthy India. So it's a national initiative launched as a part of national health policy of 2017 and it was launched to achieve the vision of universal health coverage that is health for everyone. This initiative has been designed on the lines of sustainable development goal number 3 and it is underlining commitment which is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages which we just saw as universal health coverage its vision is to provide a comprehensive need based healthcare services so it covers health at all three levels see primary secondary and tertiary levels see what is this primary secondary and tertiary healthcare see primary involves anything that does not involve hospitalization for example if you walk into a clinic say you walk in for a consultation or a general opinion or say for vaccination or for some simple injection all these in clinic procedures the primary preliminary procedures are primary healthcare anything that would involve hospitalization or any medical procedure will come under secondary and tertiary level so as we can see the primary health care plays an important role in reducing the progress of the disease to the secondary and tertiary level as well as preventing the disease from occurring itself so primary health care is much more important compared to the secondary and tertiary level according to health experts Hence see coming back to the scheme the Ayushman Bharat covers prevention promotion ambulatory care or outpatient care on all these three levels that is primary secondary and tertiary levels and it comprises of two interrelated components so first component is establishment of health and wellness centers see these health and wellness centers pertains to creation of 1.5 lakh health and wellness clinics which will bring healthcare closer to the homes of the people that is accessibility is being achieved under health and wellness centers these centers will provide comprehensive primary health care and it can cover both maternal and child health services and non communicable diseases see it also includes providing free essential drugs and diagnostic services so it is largely pertaining to primary health care and the second component is pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana which is abbreviated as pm jay or the national health protection scheme So it is a public health insurance or assurance scheme which is aimed to provide health protection cover to poor and vulnerable families against the financial risks that arises out of catastrophic health episodes so like what is happening right now like the covid situation etc So Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana provides financial protection by offering an insurance benefit cover of rupees 5 lakh per family per year students pay attention here the insurance benefit covers rupees 5 lakh per family per year and when we say per family per year the family size has not been mentioned so everyone from the family can be a beneficiary under this scheme in short it aims to reduce the out of pocket expenditure that is it aims to minimize the expenditure from the savings of the patients and note that for availing the benefits of pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana there is no cap on family age as well so this ensures that nobody is let left out of the mission and the financial protection is provided to more than 10 crore families who are poor who belong to deprived rural families and to identified occupational categories of urban worker families as per the socio economic caste census data okay so what is the coverage of this mission it covers medical and hospitalization expenses almost all secondary care procedures and most of the tertiary care procedures so it covers surgery medical day care treatments including medicines diagnostics and transport etc this means the beneficiary will not be required to pay any charge for the hospitalization expenses 
including pre-hospitalization and the post-hospitalization expenses. And another notable feature here is the scheme is completely cashless and paperless. So this creates a record for every transaction that is being carried out. Hence, there, this is believed to infuse transparency also. And it can be availed at public hospitals as well as empaneled private hospitals. And also please note that the apex body for implementation of this scheme is National Health Authority, which is an attached office under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. See students, this article is very important from the prelims point of view. Uh, these facts that we discussed right now is very important from the prelims point of view. And apart from that, from the mains perspective, you may be asked to analyze this scheme with the pros and cons and along with way forward. So that brings us to the end of this discussion. Now, let us take up this op-ed. It is about corporate tax. See, recently, the United States Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, proposed a global minimum corporate tax. If the major world economies agrees for such a tax structure, it would give a huge implication. So, let us discuss more about it. So, this is the syllabus for your reference. So, first let us understand what is a corporate tax. See, a corporate tax is also called as a corporation tax or a company tax. It is a direct tax imposed by a jurisdiction on the income or the capital of the corporations or analogous legal entities. See, the corporate tax is significant because it is a policy tool in attracting the foreign investments. See, lower the corporate tax, higher is the investors feel the country to be attractive for investments, so the country will receive higher investments. See, the idea of lowering the corporate tax to attract foreign investments has its genesis since 1990s. Now, let us discuss that. As we know that Soviet bloc collapsed in 1990, the nations in the Eastern Europe were badly hit by this collapse and they needed capital infusion to recover their economy. So, in order to attract global capital, the corporate tax rates sharply. So, as expected, this move brought them a lot of foreign capital. But this also resulted in a race to bottom scenario. See, many nations in Europe were forced to cut their taxes in response to this, one after the another, to attract the capital, but also to prevent the outflight of capital from their own countries. Even to this day, many countries are fighting in this race to get to the bottom of the tax rates. And they are constantly slashing their corporate tax rates to attract foreign capital. And this move has negative implications also. Let us see about it. See, firstly, the corporate tax is an important source of national income. So, by cutting down this tax, a nation becomes short of funds. That is, the government has lesser income. And this shortage of funds translates to cutting back expenditure on public services such as education, health and civic communities. And this will severely affect the weaker sections of the society because the weaker sections depend on the government services for their education, health and other civic amenities. Right. So now let us move on to the next major negative. The lowering of the corporate tax leads to regressive taxation regime. See, in a regressive taxation system, low income individuals end up paying higher amount of taxes compared to the high income owners. See, we know the essence of taxation itself is wealth redistribution or income redistribution. So, in a regressive taxation, the opposite happens where the low income individuals are taxed more compared to the high income earners. And we know corporates are big entities and under the regressive taxation or the cutting of the corporate tax, corporate entities end up paying lesser taxes. And besides for revenue, the government can ramp up the indirect taxes. So, if you know, most of the indirect taxes are regressive. See, the lowering of the corporate tax, which is a direct tax, has made the governments more dependent on the indirect taxes, leading to regressive taxation structure. For example, the value added tax and the goods and services tax, the GST, have been increasingly being relied on by the governments to generate revenues. And such heavy dependence on the indirect taxes will put enormous strain on the weaker sections of the society. See, apart from that, indirect taxes can also prove to be inflationary in nature. And in the long run, it will also widen the inequality in the society.
So far we have discussed two negatives one is shortage of funds in the hands of government and the second one is regressive taxation structure that will result in cutting down of corporate taxes. Now let us move on to the third one. See because of corporate taxes slashing the world experienced a phenomena called base erosion and profit shifting. Base erosion and profit shifting refers to the phenomena where the companies shift their profits to other tax jurisdictions which usually have lower taxes. For example, many of the most profitable companies like Google and Facebook are accused of shifting their profits to Ireland and other tax havens. So by shifting their profits to the lower jurisdictions, these companies pay less amount in taxes. But because of this phenomena, many countries lose their revenue. And it is said that US loses about 100 billion in revenue every year because of such practices. Therefore, to overcome such scenarios, the United States Secretary of Treasury, Janet L. Allen, proposed a global minimum corporate tax. That is a corporate tax that is globally in practice. Such a global minimum corporate tax will increase the funds for the country. That is, it will put more money in the hands of the government. Thereby, it will strengthen the public services, especially after the pandemic. And it will also pave the way for progressive taxation in the future. And besides, also by having a minimum global corporate tax, we can discourage the practice of debts. See, currently many economies are suffering because of COVID pandemic. The government needs resources to help people. It needs funds to transfer benefits, provide public services and prevent business failures. And many countries are proposing relief packages to recover economies during this pandemic. For example, the US administration has provided a massive $3 trillion package to boost their economy. And such relief packages needs a lot of money. And uh, this in turn can lead to fiscal deficit in the absence of such measures. See, what is a fiscal deficit? Fiscal deficit is the difference between the government's total expenditure and its total revenue, which excludes the borrowing. So a fiscal deficit occurs when the expenditure exceeds the revenue generated. The US administration believes that by having a global minimum corporate tax, the tax collection of the country will increase and these additional tax collections will help reduce the large fiscal deficits and it will also provide funds for better public services, especially to help the lower income section of the society. So how has this proposal been received? The proposal for minimum global corporate tax has received a mixed reception so far. For example, uh, the president of the World Bank has opposed it. According to him, such a tax structure would hinder poor countries' ability to attract investment. For example, a poor country which wants to attract investment can lower its corporate tax and attract investment. But if you are giving this policy tool as a global tool, the poor country will have limited space to maneuver and reduce its tax structure to attract any investment. Along with him, some businesses and conservative legislators have also resisted this proposal. However, some rich entrepreneurs like uh, Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett have supported this idea. Hence, the reception for this idea has been mixed so far. So, what are the author's final thoughts? See, the author believes that the global minimum tax rate is worth a try in spite of its objections. According to him, such a tax structure can reduce inequality and it can provide better public services and deter base erosion and profit shifting and it can also reduce poverty, he believes. And he also says that the role of the US is crucial in making this proposal true, largely because of its power and the global clout, which can make the countries agree and cooperate for a global minimum corporate tax. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. In this discussion, we learned about corporate tax, issues related to slashing of the corporate tax, what is regressive taxation, what is base erosion profit shifting and global minimum corporate tax. Now, let us take up these two editorials which talk about the problems in the new vaccine strategy of the government, especially in the light of vaccine inclusivity. See, what is this vaccine inclusivity? See, vaccine inclusivity is nothing but the availability and the accessibility of the vaccines to the general population. The greater the vaccine inclusivity, then greater amount of population, the more people will be accessible to the vaccine. The lesser the vaccine inclusivity, only small portion of the population will be accessible to the vaccination. So, in this context, let us discuss both the articles in a 
brief. See, this is the syllabus for your reference. So, we all know that with the second wave of COVID-19, the spread of virus has reached catastrophic proportions. And in this regard, the author talks about the revamped vaccine strategy of the government of India, which will be implemented from May 1st. Here, according to the authors, there are three key elements of this new strategy. Let us see them one by one along with the issues raised by the author. Let's go to the first issue. The first issue is that, see the vaccine is available to the entire population from May 1st who are 18 years of age and above. That is the vast majority of the population in India. Remember that when the vaccination drive started a few months ago, it was rolled out in a phased manner and it was in sync with the availability of the vaccine in the country and the demand and at that time the availability was very minimal but according to the author the issue is that a demand supply mismatch will begin to appear with this new vaccine strategy this comes when the coverage of the vaccine eligible population has expanded with the new strategy coming in and the author also notes that the serum institute of india which is the largest vaccine producer in our country has initially promised to supply about 100 million doses of vaccine a month but in reality because of fund crunches and because of lack of access to raw materials because of the ban from the US government if you remember SII could provide only about 50 million to 60 million doses per month. Here, until now, only 2% of the population has received vaccines, I mean the both the doses, while only 9% has received at least one dose. So, this questions the efficacy of the new strategy. So, coming to the second element. The second element is a significant deregulation of the vaccine market. So, know that the central government plans to give up its control over the market for vaccines. And in this regard, the vaccine manufacturers have the freedom to sell 50% of their vaccine production to the state government and the private hospitals. Also, the central government has not yet fixed the vaccine prices and it allowed the producers to pre-declare the prices they would charge from the state governments and private hospitals. So, you may recollect the price ranges have been uh, told by the serum institutes from uh, 600, 400, you know. So, all these has been criticized by the author. Now, what happens here? See, previously the central government played the role of a sole procurement agency and this helped in driving down the prices of the vaccine. But the new strategy fragments the market into three layers with the central government as a procurement agency, state government as a procurement agency and the private hospitals. And this would allow the producers to charge high prices from the state governments and the private hospitals. Also note that now the responsibility is with state governments to take the decision regarding free vaccination for people above 18 years. So here know that the central government will continue to support vaccination for people above 45 years, healthcare workers and frontline workers and all and state governments for the rest of the population above 18. So this implies that the vaccination of a significant section of the population will depend on the finances of the each state government. A rich state may be able to procure and provide it free for the people but the poor state will not be able to do that. So it will have to charge from the people so the poor states will perform badly that is the vaccine coverage among the people from the poor states will be bad. Okay. Now comes the third element. According to the author, there is a 45 billion rupees grant for the two vaccine manufacturers, the Serum Institute of India and the Bharat Biotech to boost their capabilities. Here it should be noted that the United States government has similarly provided financial support for vaccine producers, but they still charge high prices for the vaccines from the people. So the question is, why should the tax paying public bear the high prices of vaccine? when their taxes are already used to support the vaccine producers. So, the people stand to lose at both the fronts and author thinks the same can be the scenario in India also. So, author in essence says that the government should urgently address the serious doubts over the affordability of the vaccine to increase the vaccine inclusivity. This should be done by ensuring a competitive market for vaccines and vaccine manufacturing should be incentivized to ensure uninterrupted supply of the vaccine especially in this scenario. So this is about the first editorial. Coming to the second editorial, the second editorial also criticizes the new vaccine strategy of the central government. So it says that giving the two vaccine manufacturers a free hand to decide the price has made the universal COVID-19 vaccination a difficult task to achieve. See, this is largely because 
a huge percentage of those aged 18 to 44 years do not have the resource to pay for vaccines and so a lot of people are at the risk of being excluded see this point is very similar to the essence that was discussed in the first editorial right and also the year marked 50 percent supplies to the state government and the private hospitals can lead to competition even between the states and the private hospitals this in turn can drive up the prices from the suppliers of the vaccine which will again exclude the poor from the universal vaccination drive and all these could lead to dangerous situation where the containment and the mitigation measures will become even more difficult so the article says that the states will have to take a leading role in the free immunization program that is the central government should step up to the situation and they should compel the government and the companies to make pricing more transparent and assure timelines in the receiving of the supplies and the distribution of the vaccine. Only this will improve the vaccine inclusivity in India, which in turn will further enable the containment of the disease spread in the nation. This brings us to the end of the discussion on the new vaccine strategy. Now look at this news article. Recently, the Karnataka state government decided to implement the One District One product, ODOP, commonly called policy, during the next five years at an estimated cost of rupees 493 crore. And this article talks about that. So, in this context, let us learn about One District One product, which will be referred as ODOP subsequently in the discussion. Now, coming back to ODOP, the objective of One District One product is to identify one product per district as a speciality. The identification of the product should be based on the potential and the strength of a district and the national priority. And after identification of the product, this initiative will develop a cluster for that product in that particular district. And this cluster will be able to produce a world-class product with quality, scalability and brand. And this cluster will also provide market linkages. See, initially this initiative was first launched by the UP government for their state. And nationally, this initiative is now merged with the Districts as Export Hub initiative being implemented by DGFT, Director General of Foreign Trade, Department of Commerce, along with the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade as a major stakeholder. See, the Department of Commerce through DGFT is engaging with the states and the central government agencies to implement this initiative. See, the objective is to convert each district of the country into an export hub. So, how are we planning to achieve it? Firstly, identifying products with export potential in the district is of prime importance. See, some product will be speciality in some particular district and we are first identifying that product. And secondly, we address the bottlenecks for exporting. So what are these bottlenecks? It could be transport, it could be raw materials, whatever it is, right? So if the production area, the district is located in a very remote area, taking it from there to an export friendly area will be very difficult. So that will be a bottleneck and that will also be addressed. And thirdly, supporting local exporters and manufacturers to scale up manufacturing. See, we know the traditional specialities of some districts are being produced at a very small scale because of technological inadequacy or fund crunches, whatever may be the reason. But uh, this ODOP tries to support the local exporters to manufacture more of the specialty item of that particular district. And finally, we'll also find the potential buyers outside India with the aim of promoting exports, which means the marketing of that particular product outside India will also be a component under ODOP. So what will this create? This in turn will create employment opportunities in the district. And apart from that, it will also promote manufacturing and the services industry in the particular district in consideration. See, the ODOP is an initiative that is seen as a transformational step towards realizing the true potential of the district. And it is expected to fuel economic growth, generate employment, promote rural entrepreneurship and take us to the goal of Atmanirbhar Bharat that is being prominently envisaged in the recent times. Right? And uh, if you see the inspiration of the scheme, it is very interesting. The inspiration of the scheme comes from the Japanese business development concept, which gained prominence in 1979. The Japanese business development concept aimed at promoting a competitive and a staple product from a specific area to push sales and improve the standard of living of that particular local population. 
and over time this concept gained prominence in japan and has been replicated in other asian countries as well now it is india's turn and in india the odop aims to give a major push to the traditional industries synonymous with the respective districts of the state so this topic is very important from the prelims point of view and note that this scheme odop is under ministry of commerce but it has also joined hands with other ministries like ministry of food processing industry for promoting food related products apart from that even agricultural products are also included under this scheme now let us take up this opened article which talks about the challenges faced by different frontline workers especially the police force of india in the wake of the covid-19 pandemic so let us discuss them in detail students here is the syllabus for your reference see the impact of the pandemic has been discussed in another article in uh, today's discussion but here we will discuss more about the contributions of the police force in combating the pandemic okay so government has taken various steps for the migrants and the other uh, people who have been suffering from the pandemic many initiatives like pradhan mantri gharib kalyan yojana uttar pradesh rozgar abhiyan atmanirbhar abhiyan etc have been put in place but the challenges faced by the police force and the relief for the police force has probably not got enough attention that it actually deserves in this article the author mainly concentrates on the different challenges faced by the police force of our country first is with the respect of enforcing the rules and regulations that came along with the various lockdowns especially with the first wave since the punishment for violating covid-19 protocols and the lockdowns was kept mild the police had a tough time in dealing with these violators so enforcement of the lockdown by the law enforcers was very difficult the second challenge is with respect to the increased number of cases of cyber fraud particularly those relating to online purchases and phishing see with the lockdowns we know the online trade has gone up exponentially and with that the cyber fraud has also increased and the police have been burdened with the responsibility of dealing with these cases in the pandemic situation as well and the third is related to the congested prison we know that indian prisons are overcrowded and in the covid 19 situation it has brought to light the hazards of prison overcrowding and its implication for the public health so in this regard the author notes about a recent instruction from the supreme court of india in pursuance of a suo moto petition in re contagion of covid 19 virus in prisons 2020 here the supreme court instructed the high courts to decongest prisons in the wake of the covid-19 outbreak and uh, the supreme court said this must be done by releasing the convicts on parole and the under trial prisoners who are charged with offenses punishable with maximum punishment of up to 7 years and who were in jail for 3 months or more on temporary bail so all this can add to the work of police force next it should be noted that an free handed criminal can be covid-19 positive and taking the covid-19 positive individual to the prison can lead to the transmission of the infection to the policemen who arrested that criminal so they carry the risk of being exposed to the virus and along with these they also have the job to tackle the menace of people holding scarcely available medical products and maintaining public order in front of hospitals etc see we repeatedly hear news about remdesivir being hoarded and black marketed so that has to be dealt with the police force and um, we see that the hospitals are being overcrowded and people are fighting for their beds in the hospital and there also police force is needed to maintain order and peace so according to the author it is very difficult for a policeman to be safe while being on duty and many policemen have succumbed to the virus and numerous others are getting infected while helping others so the author concludes by saying that the government should be considerate towards the police force how can this be done and in this regard the scheme of a special insurance cover of 50 lakhs which was notified for the medical fraternity and withdrawn should also be notified for the police force and it should be not only extended for the police force but it must be revived and extended to all the frontline workers including the and that brings us to the discussion on this opened article so now look at this news article another wave spells more nutrition loss so as we know during the first wave of pandemic and all thousands of people suffered from loss of employment and livelihood 
and many of us are yet to even overcome the impact of the first wave of the pandemic so in that context let us see this editorial which discusses about the potential economic shock of the ongoing second wave here is the syllabus for your reference first of all let us understand what is meant by food security because author discusses about food security throughout this article extensively food security is defined by united nations committee on world food security which means that all people at all time have physical social and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious food it should meet their food preferences and dietary needs for a active and healthy life it is important to know that over the coming decades a changing climate growing population rising food prices environmental stresses will have uncertain impact on food security that is it might threaten the food availability for the people as defined above so one such example is the ongoing covid-19 pandemic coming to india our food security was no better before the ongoing pandemic in the 2019 global hunger index india ranked 102nd out of 117 countries with a score of 30.3 the index said india suffers from a level of hunger that is very serious and the author says the political and the social handling of the pandemic have added to the persisting issue of food security faced by millions in india those who are already on the brink of subsistence would be suffering the most now let us focus on the impact of the pandemic on rural india so data provided by the rapid rural community response in short for rrcr to covid-19 shows the persistence of food and financial insecurity among the poor residing in rural india know that this survey is a collective of over 60 non-governmental organizations supporting covid-19 prevention efforts in our rural areas its a most recent study was conducted between december 2020 and january 2021 about covering 11700 households that is 11700 households across 64 districts and the states covered include assam bihar chatisgarh gujarat jharkhand mostly the northern states and the important findings is uh, even today rural people are cutting down on food consumption and the most impacted state was jharkhand and the most impacted social groups were dalits and the migrants who have less access to food security schemes suffered the most have a look at this analysis for a better understanding it is clear that nearly 40% of the sample cut down on food during the first lockdown and nearly 25% continue to cut down on food during the most recent survey and those who have reduced the consumption of food are 80% of the women of the households and 73% are men 24% of boys and 20% are girls and the report also says that the protein intake has been curtailed by most of the respondents this includes on milk on vegetables egg meat pulses oil etc as you can see these are the healthy food options that is being cut down as already suggested by the national family health survey 5 that is conducted between 2019 20 and the global food policy report 2021 the reduced intake would further accelerate the impacts on the child's nutrition so as we all know cutting nutrition is a consequence of people losing their jobs or being pushed into lower income brackets over time due to the nature and the handling of the pandemic and this is exemplified by the fact that the middle class in india has shrunk by over 32 million household in the past year which means they have gone into the poverty have a look at the figure to understand the impact of pandemic in india and china according to the author over 70 percentage report to reduction in the income in the post pandemic period that is on the lockdown period and prior to the pandemic 55 percentage of the household reported earning less than 5000 per month but this number has swollen to 74 percent during the december 2020 jan 2021 period and as a result around 30 percentage sample households were seeking loans and at least half of them needed loans for even food the basic need of food These figures indicate the debilitating food and financial insecurities of poor households in India especially after the pandemic and among the rural households it is the migrants who suffered the most they have lost their livelihood during the lockdown during the first phase and at the same time when they migrated again to the cities the second wave is now forcing them to go back to their villages so the author says that about 74% of the sample households had migrant members who had returned to villages during or after the lockdown and 
then 57 percentage of the sample had gone back to the destination city for the job see 74 percentage were migrants of the sample and of the 74 57 went back to the cities for the job and 59 percentage of the remaining migrants who stayed back in the uh, rural area they also want to go back this shows that the government support provided to the migrants such as mandrega etc were fairly inadequate because they want to go back isn't it so they want the job back so this seems little inadequate so the households where migrants were the main breadwinners could not rebuild their life back to track while they exhausted their savings and fell into the vicious debt trap which is a sad state of condition and it is of no doubt that the government policies must focus on them as they will be hit severely during the second wave and for migrants stuck in the cities without work community kitchens are required and a good example for this is the amma canteens in the tn which provides very affordable food for the migrant workers the state can also ensure food security by restarting the pradhan mantri gharib kalyan yojana according to the author so pradhan mantri gharib kalyan yojana is a very important topic from the prelims perspective let us take a small moment to know more about it so know that pradhan mantri gharib kalyan yojana is a scheme a part of Atmanirmar Bharat to supply free food grains to migrants and the poor. During April November 2020 period, more than 80 crore people were provided 5 kg free wheat rice per person per month. With rising number of cases, center promised to provide 5 kg of rice or wheat per person per month for the next two months, which is a welcome step. And the author says that the government needs to provide similar support for much longer periods. The scheme shall also be expanded to include nutritious foods like pulses because we saw from the study these kind of nutritious food like pulses, eggs, meat, milk, they were being cut down in consumption. Apart from this, existing issues in Manrega such as the delay in wages and the rationing shall be resolved at the earliest. And similar to Manrega, new potential urban employment schemes should also be explode see the existing policy maker shall give utmost priority to children by ramping up the existing schemes such as providing ration to children through anganwadi's public distribution system and midday meals scheme because the children hold the future of the country so with this we have come to the end of the discussion on this particular article so with all those articles we are now in the fag end of today's discussion which is practice questions so we have two questions for today's discussion let's go to the first one with reference to Ayushman Bharat, which of the following statement is or are correct? So, first statement goes like this. The component of Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana offers the benefit cover of rupees 5 lakh per year for the families having not more than 4 members. See, we can see from the discussion that statement 1 is incorrect. There is no cap on the family size and age under the scheme to ensure inclusivity and greater coverage of the scheme. So, the first statement is wrong. And consider the second Second statement it covers surgery medical and day care treatments and we saw again in the discussion that it covers primary secondary and the tertiary component and this is provided under the Pradhan Mantri Jan Harogya Yojana component of Ayushman Bharat so statement 2 is correct consider the third statement the benefits can be availed only at the public hospitals and primary health care units see this statement is again wrong because the benefits can be availed even at the impaneled private hospitals see what are these impaneled hospitals these are the private hospitals that have agreed to take up this scheme under their umbrella okay so the correct option is option c that is two only the statement one and statement three are wrong Coming to the second question, the objective of one district, one product is to identify one product per district and develop a cluster capable of producing a world class product with quality, scalability and a brand. From the discussion of the article, we know that the first statement is correct. Consider this second statement, the initiative of one district, one product came from a Japanese business development concept and the second statement is also correct. We saw it as a very interesting concept, how we adopted from the Japan. So the correct answer is option C, both one and two. So this brings us to the end of today's discussion. So we have main questions with every discussion. Writing two answers every day will give you a significant edge in the preparation for mains as well as your preliminary exam. So post your answers in the comment section for peer review. See, pandemic is getting very, very serious outside. Let us stay 
home as much as possible and break the transmission chain. And if you like the video, like, share, comment and subscribe. Maintain social distancing. Stay home. Stay safe. Have a good day.